So um, I'm very happy that we have a panel here about causality. The, the field of causality wasn't always uh, at the center of machine learning, but I can sense that the interest is in increasing very much. So, so may maybe I should say a sentence how I, I got into this. Um, so that must, must have been around 10 years ago or so. And actually it came through a student. So uh, I had an old friend, Dominic Gansing, who studied physics and mathematics with me. Uh, and he was at the University of Karlsruhe uh, doing quantum information theory. And he had this student, uh, Xiao Hai Sun, a Chinese student, who for some reason decided he wants to do a PhD about causality and Dominic should be his advisor. <laughs> and Dominic, uh, didn't know much about causality and also not about machine learning, but he got the sense that maybe it has to do something with machine learning. Uh, so he came to Tübingen and said, well, this, uh, I have this smart student. He's very much motivated to do this, but I don't know if I can advise something in this field. How about if we uh, advise him together? And uh, uh, he started thinking about that. And uh, around the same time, Vladimir Vapnik was visiting uh, my lab. And then I also discussed with him. I was hoping for some wise advice if that's a good area to move into and I remember his advice at the end he listened to everything I told him about it at the end he said you have to think about if you want to play this game <laughs> 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 so I, I took it as um, uh, since he's Russian that's kind of a positive statement it was not <laughs> 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 it was not dismissive uh, uh, or negative immediately and also I was quite intrigued about it. I liked the idea of working with Dominic again. So we started advising him, uh, thinking about these problems. And uh, maybe I had a slightly in positive uh, bias already before, because I remember once in, in the late 90s, I was at a, at a statistics conference, which was called the interface. I don't know if it still exists. Yeah. So the interface between statistics and something else. And uh, I think I gave a talk about SVMs and, and there was another speaker today up who gave a talk about causality and uh, I found it very intriguing and uh, and also somehow it resonated with me more than the, the, the graphical models talks than that in the, those days I, I was hearing to me it felt like this is actually the way graphical models are meant and actually maybe maybe that's true because Judea Pearl is one of the fathers of graphical models um, so so then I got into this field. That maybe, maybe if everybody wants to say something about their personal relationship to causality. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, my name is Ferenc. I'm on this panel because I'm going to be giving lectures on causal inference on Thursday and Friday. Um, my personal experience or relationship with causal inference is very short. So if you ask me this time last year, I would not have said anything about causal inference. I said this is not something that I do. And what has changed to that uh, is um, in May or April, Julia Pearl uh, published his new book called The Book of Why, which is actually, I think, a very good book uh, that I recommend to people who are not in machine learning, not in statistics. It's actually a very nicely positioned high level between a popular science book and an actual something that can be the beginning of your technical interest in the topic. But before I read that book, I read his interview, which was, kind of provocative in the machine learning community and he said, quote, uh, he said something like, machine learning had a lot of successes with curve fitting, basically implying that everything we do is curve fitting and we are not solving the really difficult problems. So um, I'm, I don't want to kind of rephrase what he was saying in a way that, that, that it was not meant to, but that was basically the, the gist of it. And so I said, oh, I better actually look into what, what am I missing? Like, what, what is he talking about? And then I spent a couple of days trying to learn about do calculus, which is his thing, uh, and, and a number of other things that, that Bernard already talked about. And um, after a couple of days, I sort of had my aha moment. Like, there is a, you know, this is something that I really should have been aware of in the last 10 years. And, it, and I kind of feel, felt embarrassed that I wasn't really into this thing. And then I wrote that blog post, which, um, which maybe many of you here have, have actually read about causal, an introduction to do calculus, um, in which I also tell the story of how, how I didn't know anything about this topic. And then since then, I've been learning a bunch of papers. And also, I realized that many of the problems that I have started thinking about and solving in the context of recommender systems actually become 
much more meaningful if you formulate them as counterfactual uh, machine learning problems. And so now it's actually my work. I, I advocate for these techniques and I solve uh, some techniques with counterfactual machine learning techniques. And one of the things that I'm going to say later, but I just wanted to mention something that um, the other thing that I noticed is that it's not rocket science. It always felt to me like this is this complicated, um, impenetrable wall of maths that I'm never gonna get. And it turns out that that wall is there, but you can go around it and actually understand the, uh, the ideas behind it. And, and those ideas are relatively simple and, and easy. So if you, if you don't want to be building a research agenda around solving causality or whatever, uh, then it's actually not that difficult, the level that you, you really should be aware of these things. So um, that's what I'm trying to communicate in my talk in, uh, on Thursday and Friday, hopefully. Many of you who have not really been thinking about this, I, I try to make it so that everybody gets something, uh, something out of and they can follow up. Um, I've already been talking quite a bit, so I'll say a little bit that I've, I've also been interested in causality lately. I got interested, so Bernard is five, is ten years ago, Ferenc was in one year, and for me it was five, four, four years ago, five years ago. I take it with you, it'll be never. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, he's, <laughs> but anyway, I, I moved jobs and, um, I wanted, I wanted to learn about causality, so I, I got together my group of um, students and postdocs, and I said, we're gonna start reading every book and paper about causality we can find. And um, so then we started doing that, and read uh, Pearl's book, and Ruben's book, and um, lately we read Bernard's book, and um, read the book of why, and the motivation for this was basically to bring together the world's that I had been living in of, of scalable probabilistic inference with causality to try to develop something that's something like applied causality where we can really make causal inferences from large scale data the same way that we now know how to approximate posteriors from large scale data. Um, and the, 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 you know, the one kind of motivating, it's not that I'm working on this problem specifically, but when you sit down and read all the books about causal inference and all the papers about it, it's very theoretical, but there's one message that you get from the, from the historical perspective anyway, which is that causal inference from observational data is impossible. All right, so, so the message you get from these, from these uh, books and papers is that if you just have data, you know, like Facebook, um, then um, you can't make any causal inferences from that data. And to me that seemed silly, that with, say, we, you're a hospital and you have 250 million electronic health records of what medicines people received and what happened to those people, it seemed silly to say that it is impossible to learn, so, say, that Advil helps headaches from that data. Just didn't read right with me. And so, you know, my research motivation for working on this is to try to make headway in that problem, causal inference with observational data in this new modern era of large complicated data. <clears throat> okay, they, they invited me onto this panel two minutes ago, um, so I decided to take on a persona as the anti-causal, but um, I have uh, three sort of um, different interactions with causality as this problem. So there's a very sort of interesting paper that Paul, Paul is obviously one of the key thinkers of causality, everyone has mentioned it. And his paper was written, why Bayesian inference is not enough. And in this paper, he talks about why he calls himself a half Bayesian. And he's a half Bayesian because he feels the tools of Bayesian analysis is not enough to deal with the data of the world. Now, I found this a very suspicious statement and a whole suspicious three pages to write about. So I encourage all of you to actually go and read that paper and make a statement of your own. And even today, I'm, and I think I'm probably on the wrong side of history, I don't think this is correct. I feel some of the work of causality is because we fail just to think about the model that we have. And we are lazy about the model that we have. And because we are lazy, then all these bad kind of things of counterfactuals, or counterfactuals are a good one. We'll talk about that later. Um, sort of come up by just not thinking about the model that we have and not thinking about how we should use it. So that was sort of one um, approach. 
I do a lot of reading and also some thinking of connecting different kinds of fields. And one of the things I was thinking about quite a bit is around explanations. How is it that humans can see data and explain those kind of data? And when you study this in psychology, they will give you three kinds of classic areas of explanations. One kind of, and two of those explanations are called causal explanations. You either get causal explanations or causal mechanisms. And you have a third kind of explanation based on categorization. And you can sort of study different levels of which you can apply causal thinking to deal with this issue of explanation and then how we connect this into philosophy, what we would call abductive inference or abduction in philosophy. And then the third part, which I hope you'll see at the end of the week, is when you do reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning or thinking about actions and learning about behavior must necessarily be something causal. And how is it that we can rewrite reinforcement learning within this mechanism of thinking about cause, effect, inputs and outputs, and then you will find a way of creating that theory just by thinking about the probabilistic models, and in particular, there's one framework around what is called instrumental variables. Maybe we can talk about a bit later. So I'm still on the fence about whether we need critically and fundamentally causal inference. Do we need deno do notation, which we'll also talk about, or should we just think harder about our models? Um, and do we already do causal methods just in other words, in other frameworks, in other ways of thinking? So maybe we can have a bit of a discussion around it. Oh, Bernard has something for us as a response. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, this, this was too provocative, so I have to respond to this. <laughs> So from my point of view, the probabilistic world is just an epiphenomenon. What's really going on underneath is, is uh, causality. And we've been obsessed with uh, uh, learning about the probabilistic world, finding uh, low dimensional representations that capture the uh, dependence structure, etc. Um, Can you and we'd be explain the term epiphenomenon? Oh, so, uh, yes, so an uh, epiphenomenon in the sense that it's something that's observable on the surface but it doesn't capture the substance of what's going on underneath. So uh, the, uh, the fact that there are, so I'm not a, uh, I, I don't believe in subjective probabilities as much as you do. So, I mean, I can see situations where it makes sense to talk about them, but I'm trained as a physicist, so I'm, I, be, I believe the world is something out there that exists independent of us. And uh, actually, I think probably Pearl believes the same, but that could be a, a whole interesting discussion in its own right. Um, so from my point of view, uh, the causal structure is something that's more fundamental, uh, that lies underneath. And um, from my point of view, we should now be moving beyond, uh, beyond uh, learning uh, probabilistic structures of data and uh, uh, move towards learning structures or representations of data. So I think the whole field of representation learning uh, has to adjust to this and uh, should be interested in learning structures that support the no notions of intervention and uh, uh, generalized intervention also in the sense of shifts between data sets. I think we are starting to see the limitations of our IID obsession, of this obsession of, of, of optimizing something on one fixed data set. I think we see it in a num number of domains, transfer learning, adversarial, uh, the adversarial phenomenon, etc. cetera. Uh, so we're starting to see limitations of this purely uh, um, probabilistic approach or the approach that's after statistical dependencies. Um, so we have to move to learning models that are robust to shifts that support notions of intervention, etc. cetera. Um, so I think now is, uh, the time is gradually arriving and in a way that I've been trying to do this for the last 10 years, uh, to not treat causality as something separate, which is of course related to graphical models, but which doesn't care much about finite data, sampling, et cetera, learning, et cetera. So learning was never a topic in causality. There was something called structure discovery, but people didn't care about learning. Uh, and even less, uh, people in machine learning didn't care about how causality should influence machine learning. So people didn't, didn't think uh, causal structure plays a role for machine learning. That's something that, uh, uh, that I've been trying to do, uh, or that we've been trying in Tübingen in our work uh, to understand how uh, uh, causal thinking can inform the way you do machine learning, how it's related to semi-supervised learning, how it's related to transfer learning, et cetera. So for me, uh, I find causality fascinating as a topic in its own right, but uh, I'm even more interested in, in what it means for machine learning. And 
I am hoping that now is the time, and I see a, a, a lot of people are getting interested in that. The fact that someone like Ferenc, who is a representation learning guy, uh, is sitting here is, is to me a strong signal. Uh, the same is true for, so at the NIPS workshop, we had a panel discussion in the causality workshop. Joshua Benjo was sitting there uh, uh, saying that this is what he wants to do now. So I remember I've had discussions with Joshua over the last at least five years where he kept talking about factors of variation and I kept saying, well, uh, we should be talking about causality. And I think now is the time where he also calls it causality, uh, where these things uh, can come together. So I think it's an exciting time. Okay, do you want to go first? Um, can you... Uh, uh, can you explain the term intervention there? Then I will be kind of precise. Explain the term intervention. So uh, essentially when you when you deal with data, you observe a system. Uh, for example, you observe patients and you record their data. Uh, the question of intervention is that what would happen if I changed, if, if I sort of went in and changed any of those variables. So for example, uh, instead of just observing uh, different medication given to patients in a hospital and then whether they recover or not, I would actually go in and decide to give a medication to certain patients or not. Um, so that's an intervention and, and generally speaking I think any any time you perturb a system so that the original way in which the data was sampled is now kind of changed and now your assumptions about how the data was sampled is actually changed. Um, is that a sufficient answer for you? Um, current status of causality. Um, must I repeat the question? So I'm just wondering from the panel, can you say what is the status? You mentioned the observational data, or is it possible, is it something that it's still five or 10 years from now, or can we, is it, how usable is it, except now for the small toy examples that I've mm. seen? Can I answer your question after I also, I, I wanted to react to what Shakir was saying, and the provocation is, is sort of really working on me. Um, so, <laughs> Let's suppose, so the question was, is the, the language of causal inference is that the fact that we are now talking about do calculus, does it give anything that we couldn't do before? Is it giving us anything that no, like that cannot be covered by, you know, other frameworks like instrument or variables or reinforcement learning or whatever? My answer is that even if that would be the case, even if there would be nothing fundamentally new, um, a new language to think about problems can always be useful. And this is what I found, that even when thinking about problems that have nothing to do with causality, I feel that having understood this stuff and thinking in this language uh, can give you a different perspective on the same problem. Uh, and then I also do believe that there are things which are a little bit complicated to explain in detail, which are genuinely different from those things, and you can characterize them individually. Um, and to your uh, question about whether causal inference or causality is at the level of toy examples, no, it's not. So, for example, in, in the field that I work in, in recommender systems and, and, uh, and online advertising, uh, there are methods in production that, that or presumably in a bunch of different places, uh, that use counterfactual estimation. And, and David has worked on this as well recently. Um, so, and that those are, those combined causal inference with say deep learning. So it's not even a toy example. Mm -hmm. If you consider anything that doesn't use deep learning as a toy example, which unfortunately many people these days do, uh, then I can even say that there is even precedence of deep learning and causal inference kind of combined together. I wanted to react to something Shakir said, which was he, he asked and he's playing the role of the anti-causal. Mm -hmm. so um, he said, is, is, can we just do this with better modeling? And I think that one lesson of the nice work on causal inference that's, you know, this body of work here that's, that's out there is that the, you know, the answer is no. That, um, and, and it has to do with what uh, Ferenc and Bernard both alluded to, which is that if you're asking to make a prediction under an intervention, but it could mean it, didn't mean, it doesn't mean that you actually intervene. It could be a change, a natural change that happens in the way that your data comes. Um, a purely predictive model is not going to form predictions under interventions as well as a causal model. And I also like what Ferenc said, which is that, you know, 
at the end of the day, there's some there's some equations here, and um, so you know, it's it's I like talking about the philosophy of it. Is it really causal? Can I imagine intervening on something like gender? You know, so there's lots of debates about that, and and it's they're worthwhile debates, but those are separate from the mathematics of can I build a predictor that predicts well when the distribution of the examples coming in change. Now, even though they have the same answer, they're, you know, one maybe might sound more palatable if you are, um, you know, in a, at a company building systems that are in production. Um, and anyway, to react to something Shakir said, so why isn't better modeling better? Why isn't better modeling all we need? Well, if you have, say, two variables, X and Y, one of the lessons of causal inference is that you might build the perfect joint distribution of X and Y, perfect. Like, you have found the joint distribution of X and Y. But it might be that that, even though that joint distribution is perfect, it can't form predictions under intervention of X, that when you change X, P of Y, you, you, you can't form good predictions of Y because even though you form the perfect joint of X and Y, there's a hidden variable Z that's lurking, a confounder that affects both X and Y, and so that renders your prediction under intervention impossible. So like, um, yeah, I think we should open it up to questions. I wanted to maybe, and maybe we can answer McElroy's, so McElroy's question was, what is the state of causal inference? Um, I'm gonna stick to my persona. Actually, I'm gonna be a little bit schizophrenic. Um, I think don't get caught up in machine learning as the only place that has discovered this. They are the last ones to discover it. All of medicine has been using causal mechanisms and causal theories to decide where the drugs are useful. This happens at a planetary scale. So, you know, the question for is causal mechanisms small scale is moot because this has all drugs. I mean, that has a failure of that system, but that is the example. The second example is sort of economics. In economics, they really, outside of Pearl, we celebrate Pearl a little bit too much because in economics, they have done a great deal of body of work around what it means to do causal, take interventions within macroeconomic and microeconomic structures, and they have a great deal of results, and their language is actually far more sophisticated than the kind of things we have done in machine learning right now. But to some extent, it is very toy. We don't even know how to write out basic probabilities. The do notation is one of the most outrageous ways of writing probabilities that I think I've ever seen. It's just unintuitive when you read it. So, and the work of fairness, intervening on agenda, there's no data set that has exceeded 200 data points. No one is gonna call this scale. So, anyway, for your responses. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, well, one, I mean, I would want to respond to all of that. Um, but one part I want to bring up, which is just to understand the, um, you know, it sounded like you uh, diminished a little bit the contributions of Pearl in your persona, not your actual opinion. Yeah. Um, the, and uh, I, I think that Pearl's contributions are really quite significant here. Um, you know, what, it's true that, and, and if you read the Book of Why, it's a very nice book, and it's kind of like an intellectual, it's Pearl's intellectual journey through causation. And it, it also has a lot of his opinions in it, which is fun to read. Um, but, uh, you know, he acknowledges, more than acknowledges, he talks about the influence of economics on his thinking. And, you know, Pearl in 1988 wrote a seminal book about graphical models. And then what he did with causality, the way I see it, is that he connected the science of manipulating joint distributions with the science of thinking about interventions and thinking about predictions under interventions. And what was beautiful is that his ideas from the late 80s, Pearl's and others' ideas around graphical models, things like de-separation and message passing, they play a role in thinking about things like causal identification. And so that's a, it's a, beautiful accomplishment, it kind of brings causality into the domain of computer science and AI and machine learning, which, you know, um, yeah. I, uh, 
I agree. There's a, there's al I think there's always a natural tendency for us to uh, reduce a field to one name or to just a few names. And uh, at Perl, so I, I just noticed we have a question back there. So I'll, I'll remember you right after this. Um, uh, Perl is one of the giants of our field. I mean, obviously, he's a Turing Award winner, and I, I think there are few people like Perl in this field. I can think of like Perl, Hinton, Bavnik, etc. There, there are few, and he's an absolutely outstanding figure. And of course, but that doesn't mean that there has been nothing before. So I think he. I mean, he's very good at citing uh, earlier work. Uh, he has absorbed this rich literature and econometrics. Uh, he's sometimes quite provocative uh, in, in what he acknowledges as a contribution and what, what not. And, there, and I think many many know and others don't know. So there's a, a, like a big fight between the Rubin camp and the, the Perl graphical models world. And, and for us in machine learning, maybe the graphical models are, are naturally close because we know that already. And uh, But that doesn't mean we should ignore the other work. Um, but uh, I think it's a beautiful piece of work that synthesized uh, a lot that has been happening and unified things and gave, gave us a language to, to think about them. But at the same time, I think we also have to acknowledge that uh, there's this whole world of machine learning, estimation, etc., that Perl is not so much interested in. And, and that's our job to bring that together. Uh, and, and then there's the world of what the statisticians and econometricians uh, uh, do in terms of the, the Rubin uh, Neyman model. And uh, even though formally it's, it's probably some kind of special case of what Perl is doing, they still have developed a culture and a set of methods that uh, work in a lot of practical problems that we also shouldn't, shouldn't ignore. And, and, and people like you, uh, I know, are, are bringing this into the machine learning community now. And there's others like uh, people like Czerno Zhukov, uh, who's done very interesting work that's uh, connecting things and, and linking it into econometrics. Uh, so it's a fascinating field. Uh, I wonder, so there was a question over there. Maybe we should give her the um, chance. Yeah, um, my question is, um, when I first learned about probabilistic graphical models, um, the first two that I learned were undirected and directed graphs. And I learned that there were some things that the one could represent but the other couldn't and vice versa. Um, and since causal models are uh, just naturally directed graphs, is there no way for undirected graphs to naturally, I don't know, become part of the framework? I, I almost feel like there's, I can't um, bring Markov random fields into uh, causal models in any natural way. Um, so I don't know if you know anything about um, extending uh, causal structures to more than just directed graphs. It's an interesting uh, question. Uh, I, I can try. Maybe, maybe Dave is the best person to answer this. Um, I mean, I'd be surprised if you can find a natural connection to the undirected models, because in causation, you, you very much need the direction. Uh, the slightly confusing thing is that uh, in the graphical models community, even though this very much was influenced and, and, uh, by Perl, and maybe if we had to name one, one single person as a father of graphical models, maybe Perl could be that name. Uh, although, as before, there's also others that have contributed. Um, strangely, uh, in, in graphical models, uh, people often uh, come up with directed models and don't, they don't care about what the direction of the arrows means. So even though it, it somehow started with people like Perl, maybe at some point these uh, uh, causal roots were forgotten and people use it as a modeling tool, uh, not caring about uh, what, the, what the direction means. Um, so that's... Uh, Maybe one aspect of an answer, but I don't know if you want to, to add some. Uh, it's an excellent question. I hadn't thought that before either, that it's true. When you learn about graphical models, you learn there's directed and undirected. And then the second thing you learn is that they, there are models that you can capture with undirected models that you can't capture with directed models. And I think Bernard's answer is right, that you, that, um, it, that kind of model can't not make sense as a causal model. It could still be embedded inside a causal model. An undirected graphical model basically gives us a functional form of the correlation, the dependency structure between the random variables. It's a joint distribution with some dependency structure. And you might imagine that those variables exist in your causal model like as a little vector, and that then they live inside a bigger directed graphical model. And so that the undirected graph is essentially living on the edge, not living on the edge, living on the arrow between the directed, between the other variables and these variables in question. But um, yeah. Sure. 
Bernard wants to say something, I'll, I'll, I'll respond with my kind of practical view is that whenever, so first of all, like you mentioned, Marco Random Fields is, in a way, it's a, it's a nice, like it's a nice model class for probability distributions, but it's not really a model of the world. And I think in, um, that that's sort of a strong thing to say, but when we talk about building these directed graphs, usually we are talking about them much more structured or at a much more, much more macro level. So rather than modeling the causal influences between pixels in an image, that doesn't really make any sense. You're modeling causal interactions between objects in the image or something at, at a different level. And another answer to this is that what I found is whenever I find myself in a situation that cannot be expressed as an, a directed acyclic graph, one trick that often helps or resolves the situation is if you unroll things in time. So if you think about a um, you know, Markov chain uh, with, the, with the Markov random field that eventually converges to that distribution, uh, you can then represent that as a directed graph over time. And for example, um, restricted Boltzmann machines then turn out to be these infinitely stacked uh, directed graphical models. So there's, there, that's one way in which sometimes these cycles in your model can be resolved by observing that you can unroll them over time, just like you unroll an RNN over time and you end up with a feed forward thing. So just, uh, I also wanted to add one sentence about the connection to structural equation models. Because to me, when I learned about causality, it was very instructive that I, I got the feeling once I understood structural equation models and how they're related and how they give rise to a joint distribution and how this is related to graphic models, I suddenly had this uh, click and, and thought, okay, now I finally understand graphical models. And uh, um, I find it uh, now in retrospect uh, much more useful to teach graphical models that way, uh, even though maybe historically that, uh, I, I once asked Judea Pearl about this and maybe I'm gonna slightly contradict what I said before. I asked him about it, so how was that for you? When did you notice this connection and what did it mean? And uh, he said uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't construct stuff like that. I think it started with uh, conditional uh, uh, distributions, etc. And uh, once he understood the link to structural equation model, suddenly everything fell into place. And for, for me, as a, as a student of that field, uh, it was the same. Suddenly things made sense. So certainly for someone who thinks like a physicist, the structural equation model view is extremely useful. And from my point of view, it's almost the right way to think about graphical can models can now. Can you define for us the structural equation model? Yeah, so the, the structural equation model view is, uh, I, so I tried to introduce it this morning in the, in the talk. Um, you, you might still have been in, in bed. <laughs> So, um, uh, assuming that a large fraction of the audience was here, um, they probably have a bit of an idea. So, a structural equation model means uh, that each variable is uh, computed as a function of its causal parents, so of the things that are its direct causes, uh, and a noise variable. And uh, if you set up your variables as uh, nodes on a directed acyclic graph, and you specify a function and a noise variable, then overall this implies a joint distribution and this gives you a graphical model. So it's one way of arriving at a graphical model where the arrows have a, a causal meaning. But in a way, all the structure, everything you can do about graphic models and uh, deseparation, et, et cetera, Markov properties, follows from that. Yeah. Taking inspiration from Shakir, I want to disagree with, it seems like Ferenc and Bernard are saying throw away undirected graphical models. They're not saying that exactly, but it seems like they're saying, hey, you know, whatever you can do with undirected graphical models, you can get pretty close with directed graphical models. It might be easier to think in terms of structural equation models. But I would say, you know, the MRF example brings it up. If you can write down a, a MRF as a, an image coming from some deterministic function plus noise, then you've got a structural equation model and that deterministic function could contain in it the parameters of the MRF, and those could be the things that we're manipulating. So you might turn a, you know, um, what's the right word? Like twist a knob that, that tightens a wire, and that wire then determines the correlation between pixels. You know, you can imagine this in a mechanistic model. Yeah, no, so I, I, I would like to agree with you. Yeah. Um, I think in the end, uh, we have to always be aware of the limitations of these models. So I think a structural equation model 
uh, has severe limitations. To, it's, it can be thought of as some kind of limiting case of a complex underlying physical system that maybe is described by a set of differential equations. And uh, if we're lucky, there are some settings, maybe some ergodic settings or equilibrium settings uh, where the relation relationship between certain variables can be described by a directed graph in the set of functions. And there might be other limiting cases where they can better be described uh, by an undirected graph. Uh, so in the end, uh, they're all just approximations of more complex models, which in turn are also approximations of, of whatever is the reality underneath. Uh, so they are they can both be useful in different domains. Are there more questions? Yeah. Christian. Um, earlier in your talk, Bernhard, the um, in the structural equation models, I think you were always having these uh, DAG, so acyclic graph, right? Is there also the possibility for a cyclic graph in the framework? And if not, what do they do with chicken and egg problems? Like how yeah, do they so model that? Yes, yeah, so there's some work uh, uh, also about uh, cyclic graphs. And it's actually also related to the thing uh, that I just said. So if you take a complex dynamical system that maybe describes reality reasonably uh, closely in some domain, and now you try to simplify it and, and write down a graph that uh, captures the interventional structure among the variables without talking about the dynamics in detail, then uh, it's quite often the case that this will lead to a cyclic graph. So uh, um, you have to be very unlucky if you end up with a, with a, uh, with a DAG. Um, so uh, yes, so it's, uh, this kind of language does not always make sense. Yeah. And maybe just one other question. Um, is there, it goes a bit in the direction of toy problems and like other things. Um, so it seems like there is an increased interest in causality in machine learning um, and the motivations you gave were very sort of scientific in a way of like uh, should be the right thing to do. Um, but historically in machine learning you've seen that things like killer applications, I don't know, AlexNet increasing the sort of success in vision recognition has, has, has sparked the most interest. Are there moments like that or like you, cases like that with causality yet that have explained this increased interest as well or is it purely sort of out of academic curiosity? So I'll, I'll as the kind of applied researcher here, um, and of course uh, Dave has worked on this as well. The um, the example is recommender system. So what happens often is you have a recommender system that decides which items you want to actually recommend to the users and then the users may engage with those items. So you collect more data and then you fit your model to that new data. And there is this kind of feedback loop of your current model influencing what your sampling distribution is for the next data. So when you fit your model and then you put that into production, suddenly your assumptions about how your data was sampled change. So this is why it's important there to, to model with causal inference. But there, what you see is there's gonna be a, a people who, if you don't care about causal inference, you just have a fixed data set, there's gonna be a benchmark that you can push to oblivion by you know, optimizing more, doing bigger neural networks or finding the right architecture and so on. Uh, but at the end of the day, those gains in that finite data set don't translate to actual gains when you put that model into production. So very often you will see that we produced a 3% improvement in this metric. You then put your thing in an A-B test, put your uh, recommender system in an A-B test, and then you actually see that your metrics are flat or even went down uh, because, you, because the offline gains don't correspond to online gains. So this is a very big example where doing causal inference is the right thing to do if you actually care about pushing the online performance of a model, which is always what you want to do. So, would you? Yeah. So maybe I can I can also add. Uh, it's a, it's a non-trivial question how people choose what they work on, and if you uh, look at our community, uh, people of course follow fashions. Uh, this is a very natural. Uh, it, Ten years ago, everybody was writing kernel papers. Now everybody writes deep learning papers and. And my, my students also write deep learning papers. And I think it's clearly, uh, of course, everybody wants to get into the top conferences and looks at how does the paper have to look to get into these conferences. And we, none of us are immune to this. Um, so that's the, the one element that drives our research and maybe that drives academic research to a large extent because academic research is driven by publications. Uh, now, if you look at industrial research, and here we have an example of an industrial researcher here, uh, 
uh, you probably have a stronger element, well, industrial and academic, you have a stronger element of uh, uh, your research being driven by actual problems. And, and you'll be surprised that uh, researchers in companies talk much more about causality currently than researchers in the, in the academic world because many, many problems actually have a causal nature. Co companies don't just sit there passively observing what is related to what, but they want actionable knowledge. Some quick, you asked for you know, examples outside of science where causality is important, if there's, if that might be fueling the interest. And I, you know, the prevalence of A-B testing and then more ambitiously Thompson sampling and bandits and things like that, these like Shakir mentioned, all if you squint at them are causality. Hi. So I wanted to, uh, basically, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the uh, notion of intervention. And uh, I'm trying to pair, the, to pair this to what uh, I've been doing. So in the framework of, uh, represent, of representation learning, what would intervention look like in uh, clear terms, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, implementing it, uh, for example, in a uh, deep, generative model or any kind of representation learning system, what would that look like? What, I mean, what's the problem you're trying to solve? So it's, it's not at the level of methodology, it's at the level of the problem you're trying to solve. So if you're trying to predict the effect of a social program on the economy, then you use deep learning to represent the way that which social programs, how the social programs are allocated affect the economy, then um, the intervention is about changing that allocation of money to the social programs, for example. So it's, it's to think about intervention in the context of a method like deep learning or kernel methods makes less sense, at least to me, than in the context of a problem where there's something you're intervening on. Um, should I be the anti-causal again? Hmm. Let me think about it. I'm gonna, let me I'll give you a, another answer to you. An intervention is a very simple concept. You take a random node, you split the node into something deterministic and the source of where the noise comes in. You can do this with almost anything. So I think that's not the question you're asking. I think a good example of this is sort of what they, and maybe we can talk a little bit, shift the conversation to talk about counterfactuals. You all mentioned this idea of counterfactuals. So, Right now, Dave explained this idea of building a loss function over deep generative models, and Ferenc explained the problem that when you see the data, when a new data set comes, the data set has shifted somehow. So one way of using causal inference in the context of a deep generative model is to somehow make the model robust to the data set that you will not have seen, the counterfactual data, the data that doesn't yet exist. So you can create a loss based in this counterfactual counter where some things are things you will intervene or change, like the representation, the latent variables, certain parts of the input, the gender, for example, and then learn the model under different variations, the factual and the counterfactual, and in the simplest setting, that is a way of making a model more robust to this off-policy kind of correction, as you would call it in reinforcement learning, or this distributional shift kind of, element. but I'll come back with the anti-causal later. So, so there's a danger that we're going to get into philosophy, but I, I just feel like uh, if I were a philosopher interested in causality, probably I'll have to, I'd have to take issue with your notion of counterfactuality. Because, uh, so I think some people are using it this way, but just to sort of raise people's awareness to the problems. Uh, some people would restrict the term counterfactual to a situation where, I don't know, some process has happened uh, using certain values of variables, and now we want to know what would have happened if these values had been different and everything else, including everything that I haven't seen, would have been the same. So in a structured equation model, that means uh, what would have happened if all the values of the unobserved noise val variables had been the same, but I had intervened at this node to change that value. Um, so it's almost in retrospect, like uh, I, I don't know, I had a certain disease, I took a certain medicine, didn't work. Now I want to know, uh, would I have been cured if I had taken something else? Uh, and everything else that I don't know about myself would have been the same. So it's, uh, 
it has this very hypothetical aspect, but I'm, I'm aware uh, that there are also um, there are people who use it exactly in, in your form, uh, where it's a little bit closer to what then others would just call a, a standard intervention. But uh, I don't want to start an argument about that here. Yeah. To, to appreciate how head spinning counterfactuals are, the one I like to think about is this one. Yeah, yeah, so it's what, well, Bernard defined it, but I'm gonna, here's an example of a counterfactual in the way that Bernard described. Would Hillary have won the election had she gone to Michigan three days before the election, given that Trump won the election? Mm -hmm. So that, that is the kind of, that is the what, in, and in Pearl's book, The Book of Why, there's these three levels, that's level three of, you know, you're asking about what would have happened in a particular instance had you changed something, but you're using information that did actually happen to help influence your understanding. So you can even ask, would Trump have won the election had Hillary gone to Michigan three days before the election, given that Trump won the election? <laughs> okay. Are there more, yeah, there's more questions here. More, more questions? Sure. sure. Um, I, I wanted to, to know if you guys wanted to think a little bit more about that, or just speak about the kinds of assumptions we'd need to identify causal models in the sort of unstructured data that we've now become very familiar with in, in machine learning. So, Bernard, in your talk, you spoke about um, sort of invariance to viewpoint shifts. You sort of make, we make that assumption as people. Um, could you muse on those sorts of those sorts of things? Because a lot of the sort of data that we that have become sort of commonplace in machine learning, big image data sets and big um, text data sets and all the rest. Um, the questions we'd like to ask almost certainly are not identified um, in, this, in these models. And we kind of don't, we're reasoning at the level of pixels and not at the level of sort of symbols, I don't want to go there, but you know. Um, and kind of, do you have any ideas on what, on what sort of assumptions we'd need in order to, to identify things like that? Uh, I'll try to answer this, but I'm the least qualified person to answer this here, I think. So I think there are two problems that are both kind of called causal inference or causal something. One is if you already encoded your assumptions about what causes what. So you have a model and you've drawn this diagram. And now you, given that diagram, those are your assumptions. You do this before you see your data, whatever. Um, those are your assumptions. That's the causal model. And now you can ask questions, like you can ask the counterfactual question of, you know, would Hillary have won the election and so on, or you can simulate uh, situations where you would intervene. What, what would happen if I give this medication to these patients? So there the assumption is the causal graph itself, and if you change, and, and your analysis is only correct if those causal assumptions are kind of correct, and we know that they are never correct, but at least you can hope that they are roughly correct or not completely wrong. In my case, by the way, I can draw the causal graph because it consists of systems that we have built, so we actually know what feeds data into what other thing. In biology, it's very difficult because we don't know what influences what. So that's one class of problems. The second class of problems, which is where, uh, where I think Bernard's work, and, and I don't know if you're going to touch on this, is causal discovery, which is I don't know the causal graph. I want to infer the causal graph from the raw data and that's, generally speaking, impossible in many cases. And then if you add certain assumptions, then under those assumptions, you can identify these causal links to a certain statistical power. Um, so, so there, the assumptions are things, uh, and assumptions about the smoothness of these functions in the structural equation model, but I guess Bernard can be more precise. Yeah, yeah so I'll say something about this uh, tomorrow. So. Uh, I think we're, we're gradually running out of time. There was also a question over here. You you, just take one more this was the la last question, right? Uh, is, if that's okay, because I think we will still be around. You can uh, talk to us in the break tomorrow, so we'll take this as the last one. Um, yeah, thanks for your talks and those that are to come. So my question comes with when you, um, for instance, look at uh, um, systems that operate uh, models, uh, let's say with deep learning, they, the, the algorithms will come up with results that you won't necessarily know how it got there. And so for instance, um, I think there was a case where Uber ran over a pedestrian. And so if let's say the, um, the, the neural networks behind the decision to do that 
um, is, there, is there a possibility to know how the uh, algorithms came to that point? Uh, and is there, could the, um, the levels actually teach us something new? Like for instance, with AlphaGo, it came with uh, strategies that humans never used before. So are there, can we draw information from the actual uh, neural networks? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yes, so I think uh, there is work uh, going in this direction. So people use, uh, there's a, a, a law scholar at Oxford University, uh, Sandra Wachter, uh, who writes law papers about how to analyze uh, uh, black box systems uh, counterfactually. Uh, so she's arguing that uh, maybe we don't understand these systems in detail, but we can always, given the system, so given a machine learning system that's deployed, you can think of this as a causal system that takes inputs, does certain computations, produces outputs, and then you can ask questions like, uh, uh, so if, if I have the data of, uh, of how the bicycle came over the road, um, uh, if, if I had changed certain areas uh, or maybe added noise or whatever, what would have been the output of the system? So you can, you can query an existing uh, a system counterfactually if you want, uh, keep certain things the same, vary others, and, and see what would have changed to the output. So that's way of one way of analyzing a system. Uh, but I think your question also connects to a number of other things. It connects to the issue of, of explainability of systems. I think causality also has something to say about explainability, uh, because for instance, if I, arguably, if I, if I build a system that uh, predicts the human birth rate from the frequency of storks in a country, and then I want to communicate what, what this system sort of understands uh, about the world to somebody else. And then it would be uh, kind of it would be kind of dumb to just say uh, the system says the more storks there are, the more babies are born. Then a, a different kind of explanation would make more sense to somebody else because explainability certainly has something to do uh, uh, with how humans communicate because it's an explanation to us. We, we don't want the machine to explain it to another machine. And uh, we are uh, causal uh, animals. We communicate in terms of causation and much more than in terms of uh, statistical dependence. I have nothing compact to say um, that's short in response to that question. So let me just close by saying how amazing the questions were. I think they are really good questions. So thank you for those questions.